It is the nature of everything in existence to rise and fall throughout its life. We ascend and we plunge, but sometimes, often it is not the descent that matters, but the ascent. Throughout Tamriel's history, there have been many occurrences where folk, towns, cities, kingdoms and empires have climbed to great heights and plunged to great depths. But, some manage to get back up, reach further and climb higher than before. This is no more applicable to a certain guild of assassins than it is the few imperial empires that have come and gone. They are known all over Tamriel as the servants of the Dread Lord, and are feared by many as much as a Daedric Prince, for they are the Dark Brotherhood. In the northeast corner of Tamriel lies Morrowind, the home of the Dunma. There a system of legal murder was established, and it was the product of an ancient guild of assassins called the Morag Tong. The Tong's origins are shrouded in mystery, though whenever and however it began, the guild's reputation rose swiftly, and they were regarded as unequal killers. At the end of the first era, in 2920, they received the highest profile contract to date. The target was Emperor Raymond III. The Tong successfully carried out the assassination, bringing an end to the Raymond dynasty and bringing forth the rise of the Akaviri Potentate, the period following Raymond's murder and those who led Tamriel in place of an emperor. In 1E 2703, a full-scale invasion of Tamriel by various peoples from the continent of Akavir took place. It was the first Akaviri invasion. At Pale Pass in Cyrodiil where the Akaviri forces were eventually defeated by Raymond I, their defeat led to them being granted amnesty in return for their service in Raymond's army. Thus, in the few centuries that followed, the Akaviri had influence in numerous areas of life in Tamriel. Under the Raymonds, an emperor's chief advisor was called the Potentate, and in 2920, it was Vesidju Shayi. It is said Vesidju plotted to overthrow the empire, and had both Crown Prince Julek and his father, Emperor Raymond III, assassinated. The potential traitor took over the leadership of the empire, but retained the title of Potente. He declared the end of the First Era, and ushered in the Second. The Potentate's rule was not without challenge, however, as armies loyal to the Raymonds as well as those belonging to individual kingdoms seeking more independence clashed with Vesidju's forces. It wasn't until 2E283 that the Potentate finally emerged victorious after a number of campaigns but the war resulted in an empire weak and its kingdoms poor. Vesidju Shayi would go on to bring in the Guild Act in 2E321, allowing what would become the Fighters Guild to be established. Three years later, the Potentate was assassinated by the very organization he had possibly hired to kill his predecessor. The Morag Tong had become bold and arrogant, supposedly literally painting the words Morag Tong on the walls with the Potentate's blood. Following this disturbing event, they were swiftly outlawed across Tamriel, as its lords and nobles feared for their lives. But the guild managed to barely survive within its homeland Morrowind, maintaining a discreet presence for years to come. It is widely believed that it was around this time a new organization formed from those that broke away from the reduced Morag Tong. They would operate completely outside of the law. No writs of execution would be required. No target was too high profile. Fear, mystery and frightful rumors became their defense, and the whole of Tamriel would be their playground. They would call themselves the Dark Brotherhood. Due to the incredible secrecy of the Brotherhood, its origins are often contested and mostly unknown. 
The Morag Tong worshipped and murdered in the name of Sithis and Mephala, the Daedric Prince of Murder, Sex and Secrets. Some believe that in order for the Tong to survive in Morrowind, they had to give up their worship of Mephala, and instead worship Vivek, one of the three tribunal gods of Morrowind. This has been considered a part of the reason some in the Tong broke away to form a new guild, but the Dark Brotherhood consider Sithis above everything, though they are not or perhaps weren't solely a religious group. Another theory is that one night, Sithis spoke to a former member of the Tong and asked that they form a new organization where only he was worshipped and business and death become entwined in order to satisfy the Void's hunger for souls. The Void is regarded to be the dimension that exists outside of other known realms, such as Oblivion, Aetherius and the mortal plane Mundus. Sithis is acknowledged to be neither Daedra nor Aedra. It is said that he is responsible for the creation of all mortals through Lorcan. For all the theories, there are a few with one commonality, the Night Mother. It is not often contested that the Dark Brotherhood's formation was in the 300s of the Second Era. Accounts share the belief of a woman known as the Night Mother, who led or leads the Dark Brotherhood. What sources differ on is her original role and the emergence of the Brotherhood. One source tries to paint the Night Mother as no one but Mephala, only the Brotherhood never called her by her true name. Another account comes from a second era poet and writer, Enric Milras, who claims that he actually met the Night Mother herself. She apparently told her less dramatic story than those present elsewhere, particularly the historical series 2920, The Last Year of the First Era by Karlovac Townway. She and the Brotherhood supposedly emerged from not the Morag Tong, but the Thieves' Guild. There were apparently some within the Guild that considered sneaking around a target's house during a burglary too inconvenient, thus strangled the occupant to death. The Night Mother had then suggested to the Guild that a segment be dedicated to the arts and sciences of murder. However, they considered murder bad for business, that it would generate too much attention. Though she agreed that they were probably right, she discovered that there was even greater profit to be made from the killing of not targets of theft, but the enemies of rich folk. And so she began to murder people differently, leaving two stones on their eyes, one black and one white, as a sort of calling card which she would come to no longer need. She supposedly hired some of the assassins that were once a part of the now collapsing Morag Tong. Enric wrote that because the Night Mother had told him her story, she could not let him live unless he was willing to agree to a concession or two in exchange for his life. Milras apparently helped the Night Mother and her newly established Dark Brotherhood commit acts too despicable for him to mention. Before long, he changed his name, fled to a faraway land, and wrote his book. While his account cannot be taken as fact, it is worthy of note that Enric was murdered shortly after the book's publication. Two stones, one black, and one white had been brutally crushed into the sockets of his eyes. Another report labels the Night Mother as once the head of the Morag Tong. Then there are reports of it being a title passed down to female local leaders of the Dark Brotherhood. However, it can be said by a great many that the Night Mother is an immortal spirit, revered and worshipped by the Brotherhood, and a popular legend says, that once upon a time in what became the city of Breville in Cyrodiil, there lived a dark elf woman. This woman claimed to hear a voice inside her head, the voice of Sithis himself. One night in her bedchamber, Sithis came and sired five children 
which were destined to die. Two years passed before the Dreadlord's ultimate plan was followed through. One night, the Dark Elf murdered her children and sent their souls straight to the Void, to their father. However, when the people of the village where the woman resided found out about this atrocity that was considered too far even for the Morag Tong and the Night Mother, they marched on the woman's house. There they killed her and burned the structure in which this horrid act took place, bringing about an end to this story. Or so they thought. Over 30 years passed until one day, a man heard a comforting voice in his head, just as the Dark Elf heard Sithis. The voice identified itself as the Night Mother, and she named the man Listener, and had gained a new servant. She sent her servant on a path to found a new organization that would dedicate itself to the worship of only Sithis and the business of murder. It was to be called the Dark Brotherhood, and as the organization would rise in wealth and power, the Void's hunger for souls would be more than satisfied. It was, as she supposedly said, the perfect arrangement. Legend says that in the early days of the Brotherhood, the bodies of the Night Mother and her children were removed from their original graves and placed within a crypt beneath the site of her house in Breville. There in that same spot once stood a statue for thousands of years known as the Lucky Old Lady. But the truth is, for those that stand upon that soil, they stand upon sacred yet evil ground, and upon the tomb of the Night Mother herself. So you could say for some seeking fortune, their luck actually ran out. To add to all of these records of potentially false claims and speculation is a note addressed to Brother that was found beneath the floorboards of an abandoned house in the Nordic village of Jallenheim in 2E358. On the note was a single drop of blood, and it outlined a war between two mysterious organizations. Scholars believe that it is of course in reference to the shadowy war between the Dark Brotherhood and the Morag Tong. Then there are the journals of the Blood Queen Arlimahera of Hegath in Hammerfell. The journals spoke of her slaying her enemies with her own hand, but sometimes with the help of the Night Mother and her Brotherhood. Supposedly, they were a tool employed for many years by her family. Whatever the origins of the Dark Brotherhood and their unholy matron, it is known that after the fall of the Second Empire, thanks to Vesidu Shayi's son, Severian Chorak, and all his heirs being assassinated by an unknown group, the Dark Brotherhood rose in wealth and power. With the end of the Second Empire came the beginning of the Interregnum, and it was before and during this time that the Brotherhood displayed the height of its power. With guidance from their Night Mother, the organization had become a well-structured and prosperous one, but even when bathing in the pool of success, misfortune can occur that can bring everything to a halt, or even send it crashing down. The fundamental difference between the Morag Tong and the Dark Brotherhood was that the Tong was a cult, whereas the Brotherhood, while also a cult, was a business. Like almost every business, they had rules and deep organization. There were a number of ranks given to successful members, but the noteworthy include the head of a sanctuary, the bases of operations for the Brotherhood that were once scattered across Tamriel. Sometimes the leaders were called matrons should one be female. And then there were the silencers, whose identities were kept from the rest of the Brotherhood. They were the personal assistants of the four speakers. The speakers themselves were the third most powerful members as they formed the majority of the Black Hand, the ruling body of the organization. It consisted of five members, 
each to represent the parts of a hand, four speakers for four fingers, four silences for the nails of those fingers, and at the top beneath the Night Mother, leading this inner circle of exceptional assassins, was the listener, the thumb of the hand. The listener is the one to whom the Night Mother spoke, and it is their job to relay the Mother's messages to the speakers and oversee the Dark Brotherhood. Through the Night Mother was the traditional way the organization received its contracts. But employing the services of the Brotherhood was not as simple nor widely accepted as some may think. In order to contact the Brotherhood, or rather the Night Mother, one has to perform the well-known yet infamous Black Sacrament. It is a ritual that allows the performer to contact the Night Mother herself, who in turn speaks to her listener to relay the contracts to the speakers who dish them out to Brotherhood members across the lands. The ritual involves one stabbing actual body parts, including a heart, skull, bones and flesh, within a circle of candles, using a dagger anointed with nightshade, all the while, whispering the unsettling phrase, Sweet mother, sweet mother, send your child unto me, for the sins of the unworthy must be baptized in blood and fear. The night mother hears this plea, and down through the hierarchy the contract goes, until it reaches a dark brother or sister that will carry out the deed. On top of this successful yet secretive system and hierarchy were the rules each and every member had to obey. To break one was to invoke the wrath of Sithis, and that is said to be more than just a warning. These rules written in ancient parchment were the five tenets. Tenet one being, Never dishonor the Night Mother. Tenet two, Never betray the Dark Brotherhood or its secrets. 3. Never disobey or refuse to carry out an order from a Dark Brotherhood superior. 4. Never steal the possessions of a Dark Brother or Dark Sister. And finally 5. Never kill a Dark Brother or Dark Sister. To do so is to invoke the Wrath of Sithis. The Wrath of Sithis is believed to be in the form of a powerful wraith that searches for and attacks Brotherhood members who have broken the rules, attempting to drag their souls to the void. It has been known that should one kill the wraith, one would be given a second chance. The Dark Brotherhood do not shy away from the most unaccepted murderous of folk. In fact, They've been known to recruit serial killers, vampires and werewolves. One only needed to get their attention by murdering someone, but one of their main sources of new blood was the Shadow Scales. For a large portion of Brotherhood history, the organization had a special relationship with the Argonians of Black Marsh. The Shadow Scales were an order of Argonian assassins that either joined the Dark Brotherhood or served Black Marsh while following the same five tenets. Argonians born under the sign of the Shadow were taken at birth and offered to the Dark Brotherhood, who at a secret facility in Archon trained them in the arts of stealth, combat and assassination. Once one became of age, they were accepted into the family as a full member, and unlike other Dark Brothers and Sisters, if a Shadow Scale broke a tenet, they were executed. The Brotherhood is an organization where trust and secrets were everything, but like many families, there's always one who cares little for loyalty. The Dark Brotherhood has had its fair share of traitors throughout its history, but there's a way, an extreme but effective one that the Brotherhood used to put down a threat. It is known as the Purification, an ancient rite that involves the Black Hand cleansing the Brotherhood of mistrust and treachery by purposeful assassination of their own assassins. It is a drastic measure that has rarely been carried out, 
and one that can wipe out entire sanctuaries. The idea is to offer the souls of the assassins to Sithis as a sign of loyalty, while attempting to eliminate traitors in the process. But this comes with merely a hope of doing so. It was not until the Dark Brotherhood had become a powerful force to be reckoned with across Tamriel, by the 6th century of the Second Era, that the first purification would take place. In the mid-Second Era, in an ancient Argonian Zanmir called Zith Isko, located in the swampland of Blackwood, was a Dark Brotherhood sanctuary. Betrayal and corruption had grown within the ranks at Zith Isko, and so the Black Hand ordered it to be purified. An Imperial woman, Lyra Vera, was ordered to assassinate her fellow brothers and sisters at the Zith Isko sanctuary, but a shadow scale called Green Venom Tongue had survived thanks to working deep in the marsh at the time. Upon the successful murders of her brothers and sisters, Lyra was appointed as the silencer of then-speaker Arawen. However, the killings of her family had a serious impact on her, and she grew to become disappointed with the Brotherhood, her loyalty rapidly fading. Her next contract took her to the Gold Coast in Cyrodiil, where she assassinated Primate Jonas of the Order of the Hour, a military group within the Akatosh Chantry. Upon his murder, his successor, Primate Artorius, offered Lyra to become his champion, given the title, The Black Dragon. Vera accepted, abandoned the Dark Brotherhood, and began using her talent as an assassin to wipe out the guild. By 2E583, Lyra had killed several members of the Gold Coast Sanctuary beneath Varen's Wall. Despite this, the Gold Coast group was doing very well. It was in this year that they successfully carried out the assassination of Anvil's self-declared governor, Fortunata Abdugo, on the request of Count Carlos Aquilarius, the nephew of once Emperor Varen Aquilarius. Green Venom Tongue later discovered through visions of Lyra's purification her betrayal. She was then assassinated by the Dark Brotherhood, and the wrath of Sithis dragged her soul to the void. Subsequently, her superior Primate Artorius was also assassinated, impaled by his own staff. Throughout the Interregnum and the Tiber Wars several hundred years later, the Dark Brotherhood prospered and grew in power. They became deeply feared by many if not most, and their services hired by even those within the Imperial government. Some even had the Brotherhood target members of the Septim dynasty, as in 3E41, Tiber Septim's own heir, Pelagius I, was assassinated while knelt in prayer at the Temple of the One in the Imperial City making his reign last a mere three years. Around 3 E 405, during the events of the Warp in the West in the Iliac Bay region, the Dark Brotherhood was quite active all across the continent. Accepted, but ignored, they continued to fill the void with swords, and in turn their coffers with gold. It has been said that some within the Brotherhood during this time worship not Sithis, but Mephala as they may have once done under the Morag Tong. Sixteen years later, a notorious vampire called Greywind Blenwith began a crusade against the Dark Brotherhood. He claimed to have heard Sithis speak to him and order that all members must be infected with porphyric haemophilia, the vampire's disease. In Cyrodiil, Greywind founded the Crimson Scars, a group of vampire assassins that broke away from the Brotherhood. Unfortunately for them, one of their own betrayed them. A Dunman named Solarion informed the Black Hand who exactly the Crimson Scars were and what they were planning. The Hand ordered the second purification in the Brotherhood's history, and Greywind's sanctuary died as one by one, members were stabbed in the heart by a silver blade. Somehow, 
Greywin and another Scar called Rowley Erdwolf managed to escape the slaughter. Greywin retreated to his old refuge he named Deepscorn Hollow, far to the south in County Leowin on a peninsula overlooking the Topol Bay. The vampire sent word across Cyrodiil to any Scars that may have survived, and for over a month he waited in Deepscorn Hollow, but no word from other Scars ever came, nor did his Lord Sithis speak, and so he turned his attention to the lair. He constructed a shrine to Sithis to try and appease his quiet master. He continued to murder mortals and eventually, in the same year of 421, he found Rowley Erdwolf at the Wayne Inn outside of the Imperial City. It was Rowley who provided Greywin with the tools needed to improve the Hollow, and several months would go by before Sithis supposedly spoke to him yet again. Sithis expressed his displeasure, but would approve of the Crimson Scars only if Greywin was willing to cure himself of vampirism as punishment for his prior betrayal. For a while, he searched and searched for a cure, until coming across an old dusty tome within a ruined fort that revealed the answer. Purgeblood Salts Twelve years would pass by before he was ready to bathe in the salts. Greywind sent word to an adventurer he'd been watching, gave the hollow to them, and asked that they honoured Sithis. Greywind then knelt down before the shrine he constructed for one last prayer, and as the first verse was spoken, he felt a sharp pain explode across his back. The Dark Brotherhood had finally found him. As for Rowley Erdwolf, he would later be found by the adventurer seeking to improve on the old lair in 3E-433. During those 12 years, however, the Brotherhood suffered yet another setback in 3E-427. The organisation had never been truly successful at establishing a foothold in Morrowind, mostly thanks to the Morag Tong, who were still going strong there. This was especially true for the island of Vardenfell, as it was home to the headquarters of the Tong in Vivek City. In that year, the Brotherhood tried to once again establish a foothold, but they were repelled, and the local Night Mother, as some called her, Severa Magia, was killed. Sometime in that same year, King Lalu Helseth of Morrowind hired the Brotherhood to assassinate the Nerevarine the believed to be reincarnation of the ancient Kaima lord, Indoril Nerevar. Helseth feared that the hero would challenge his rule, and the Nerevarine responded by travelling to Old Mournhold beneath the new capital, and eliminating the assassins and their leader, Dandras Vols. The Brotherhood also made an attempt on the life of Queen Baenzia. Fortunately, the Nerevarine intercepted the assassins. Though the Brotherhood despite this enjoyed a great number of years of success, nothing truly lasts forever, and it wasn't long before they'd suffer one of the most major setbacks in their history. What is the cover of night? By 3E433, the year of the Oblivion Crisis, the Dark Brotherhood's infamy continued and grew. In Cyrodiil, they were situated in the eastern city of Chadenhall, beneath an abandoned house where their sanctuary was located. According to rumours circling around that time, the Count Andalin Daris may have been blackmailed into ignoring the Dark Brotherhood presence in his city, or perhaps threatened into doing so. The death of his wife, Lathasa, was mysterious, and it had been suggested that the Count himself was involved. The Guild of Assassins was thriving, even in this time of crisis. One of the more noteworthy contracts undertaken around this time was the assassination of Francois Motier. Only his soul would never actually reach the void. Motier was of an old Breton, Cyrodiil-based family, and had made some powerful enemies. As a result, he needed the Brotherhood's help to not kill them, but fake his death. However, 
The void hungers for souls, Sithis demands a life. And so Francois effectively offered the Brotherhood his own mother's life in exchange for his. Francois was to be killed in front of one of his enemy's associates with a dagger coated in langer wine, a poison making a person appear dead. It's possible that as Francois shared the same name as Mirabel Motier, a member of the Dark Brotherhood in the Second Era that was killed by the Black Dragon, that the two were related. The Motier name has been associated with the Brotherhood for a very long time, and this would not be the last the family called upon the Night Mother for help. Another noteworthy contract was the assassination of Adamus Philida, a commander of the Imperial Legion that spent much of his life trying to hinder the assassins when and wherever he could. He eventually retired in 433, and the assassins could not stand to see someone who had caused them so much trouble retire in peace. But, for these few successes in a short span of time, there would be an extreme event that almost decimated the entire organization. Soon after the murder of Philida, the Black Hand had discovered a traitor within the Chaden Hall ranks. One of the speakers at the time was Lucian the Chance, a revered and legendary assassin of the Dark Brotherhood. Lachance ordered a new recruit to carry out the third purification in the Brotherhood's history. The Chaden Hall Sanctuary was wiped out, and the new assassin became Lachance's silencer as a reward for their loyalty. But the drastic and ancient ritual proved fruitless, as members continued to die, but not by the hands of the betrayer. One of the systems employed for a speaker to pass orders to their silencers was through the use of dead drops. Orders would be hidden in public places and recovered by the silencers. The only problem with this system was that should another party know the location of these drops, they could cause significant damage. Over time, Lachance left his new silencer orders of whom to kill, and every time his personal assassin carried them out to the letter, However, it turned out that later dead drops were not those from the chance. The traitor within the Brotherhood had been swapping the original drops for their own, which tasked the silencer unbeknownst to them to eliminate elite and high-ranking members of the Dark Brotherhood. The killing streak eventually concluded with the accidental assassination of the listener at the time. He was a Bosma called Ungolin. Each night he visited the lucky old lady in Breville to hear the words of the Night Mother. Unfortunately, on one particular night, his luck ran out. Lachance had finally realized what was going on, but he was too late to stop Ungolim's murder. It didn't take him long to realize that his silencer had no idea they were killing fellow members, and so tasked them to investigate. What they uncovered was something disturbing to say the least, even by Brotherhood standards. In a cellar beneath the lighthouse in Anvil was the nightmarish home of the traitor, littered with bodies of animals and people, and upon a table placed on a plate was the head of the traitor's long-dead mother, and beside it, a journal written in blood. It told the story of Lucy and Lachance murdering the author's mother, and the plan to completely destroy the Brotherhood from within, as the silencer took the evidence to a farmhouse where Lucian was hiding, thanks to the Black Hand believing him to be the traitor. They discovered that they were too late. The Hand had found him. There in the farmhouse, hanging from the ceiling, was the mutilated corpse of Speaker Lachance and gathered around was the rest of the Black Hand, and the silencer was now appointed to take his place. Due to the current state of the Brotherhood and the need for a new listener, the Hand promptly travelled to Breville. They gathered around the lucky old lady statue and opened the dread crypt beneath. They sought the help of the Night Mother herself, 
and as she awoke to demand the meaning of this intrusion, the traitor finally revealed himself. Another speaker, Matthew Bellamont, admitted his betrayal as vengeance for his murdered mother, something the Night Mother herself had known all along. Over the years, Bellamont had been driven insane and conspired with his own mother's head. Finally gaining access to the unholy matron herself, his true colours were shown, and he brought down two of the four speakers before attempting to attack the Night Mother, and in turn being slain by the newcomer. The mother bestowed upon the newcomer the title of listener, and Arquen, the only surviving speaker, began the re-establishment of the Chaden Hall Sanctuary and served as mentor to the new leader. Although the traitor was finally extinguished and the Brotherhood recovering, with the loss of over half its Black Hand and a number of its Cyrodiil-based members, the organisation was crippled and it only got worse in the following 200 years. With the end of the Oblivion Crisis came the beginning of a new era, and since the very beginning of the Fourth, the Dark Brotherhood struggled to recover. This struggle continued for over 170 years until it began getting worse at the outbreak of the Great War between the Third Old Mary Dominion and the struggling Imperial Empire. Along with the rest of Tamriel, the war took a huge toll on the Brotherhood, and riots that erupted in Bruma, Breville and Chaden Hall became major problems. The Shadowscale training facility in Archon was closed, and the sanctuary in Bruma was eventually destroyed around 4E-186. The only known surviving member was a Dark Brother called Cicero. Cicero fled to the Chaden Hall Sanctuary and was welcomed with open arms. Before that, he began writing a journal that detailed parts of his life and some of the events that transpired following the Bruma Sanctuary's destruction. By 187, Many contracts were flowing to the Chaden Hall group after a number of sanctuaries and bases across Tamriel were either destroyed or abandoned. The Brotherhood was losing footholds across the continent at an alarming rate, and with them, the organization's power, reputation, and influence. Internal struggles didn't help the situation either, as the Black Hand was apparently torn on whether they should expand or consolidate. The listener at the time, Alessane Dupree, had a private residence in Breville from where she commuted to the Chaden Hall Sanctuary. The possibility of reopening the Shadowscale facility was contemplated, but the lack of resources brought an end to those discussions. In the next year, the Brotherhood lost its foothold in Wayrest in High Rock. The sanctuary there was raided and destroyed by Corsairs. No survivors emerged and now there were only three holds remaining. The Chaden Hall Sanctuary in Cyrodiil, the Falkreath Sanctuary in Skyrim, and the Corinth Sanctuary in Elsewhere. Soon after, however, the Black Hand ordered that the Corinth base be closed, and its members merge with those in Chaden Hall. The Brotherhood had been greatly reduced to a relatively small organisation that gave the illusion of it being much more. But the worst was still to come. Breville was in chaos. The southern city had become the battleground of two of Cyrodiil's largest skooma traffickers, and Alessane Dupree was forced to hire cell swords to guard her property. Before long, the Night Mother herself was in danger. The statue of the lucky old lady was destroyed, and Dupree sealed herself in the undiscovered crypt below. Two assassins from Chaden Hall were dispatched to aid in the crypt's defence, and weeks went by before word had reached Chaden Hall of what exactly happened. Sooner or later, the Night Mother's crypt was discovered and raided. Two of its defenders died, including the listener Alisane, who was burned alive by mage fire. The third defender, an assassin called Garnak, managed to fend off the attackers 
and fled the city alive with the Night Mother's coffin in tow, though it is unknown what happened to the skeletal remains of her children. Garnag brought the coffin back to the Chaden Hall Sanctuary, and without a listener, contracts had to be gathered by word of mouth. By the time the new year, 189, rolled around, the Night Mother had still not yet spoken, and so the leader of the Chaden Hall group, Rasha, decided to revive an ancient position within the Brotherhood, the rank of Keeper. The Keeper's job was to safeguard the Night Mother's remains and keep them preserved so as not to sever the connection between her spirit in the Void and the Mortal Plane. The revived position was given to Cicero, who before taking up the mantle completed one final contract on a jester that laughed and laughed until he didn't. Months went by until late in the year, Chaden Hall erupted into violence, though the sanctuary remained unbreached. This, along with the Night Mother's silence, demoralized the surviving members in Cyrodiil, which numbered only four. Eventually, Rasha, the only surviving Black Hand member, proclaimed himself the new listener. But when he failed to recite the words taught to all listeners and confirmed by the Keepers, he was executed, and so ended the Black Hand. It would be another two years before one of the three remaining, Pontius, was killed by a bandit while wandering around the city. Garnag eventually left to gather food, but never returned, leaving only Cicero and the Silent Night Mother alone in the sanctuary. The Keeper remained in the sanctuary for another year before leaving, through a combination of isolation, destroyed morale, and desperation, Cicero went mad and took on the persona of a jester, likely thanks to his last kill, the one he never forgot. Fortunately for him, there was one more sanctuary still standing. Deep in the pine forest of Falkreath in Skyrim, once stood a sanctuary overseen by a Nord woman called Astrid. Under her leadership, the five tenets were discarded, and all Brotherhood traditions and culture with them. Cicero wrote letters to Astrid, seeking a new home for him and the Night Mother. On the 31st of Sun's Dusk, 4E200, he slipped out of Chaden Hall and set sail for the Nordic province alongside the Night Mother's huge stone coffin. Upon arriving in Skyrim, Cicero journeyed not to Falkreath, but Dawnstar, where an old sanctuary still stood, abandoned. He resided there with the Night Mother for around a year until the silence became unbearable, and he desired to find a listener and teach Astrid the error of her ways. In the year of the Dragon Crisis 201, he loaded the coffin onto a cart and set out across the tundra and forests of Skyrim to the sanctuary in the south. Although, it has been disputed on whether or not Cicero actually made it to Falkreath. The secrecy of the Brotherhood leads to conflicting reports in their story, such as the origins and identities of those within it. Some report that what was left of the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim were wiped out by Commander Marrow and the Penitus Oculatus, the Emperor Titus Mead's personal security and intelligence organization, and thus, there was no brotherhood for Cicero to return to. On the other hand, there are elaborate conflicting accounts that the brotherhood not only survived the efforts of the Penitus Oculatus, received Cicero and the Night Mother, but went on to fulfill one of the biggest contracts in the brotherhood's history. And you could say that these latter reports are far too consistent and detailed for there not to be any truth to them. During the Dragon Crisis in 4E201, rumours of a runaway orphan swiftly spread across Skyrim. The child was Aventus Aretino from Windhelm, who at the age of 10 lost his mother, his only guardian due to being fatherless. With no one to take care of him, Jarl Ulfric Stormcloak sent him to Honor Hall Orphanage in Riften, 
until when he came of age, he could return and claim the Aretino residence for his own. Honor Hall Orphanage was home to a number of children and their carers, Constance Michelle and the infamous Grelod the Kind. She was the headmistress of the orphanage and contrary to her name, was a cruel and heartless woman. She beat the children under her care and refused anyone wishing to adopt one of them. Aventus managed to escape Honor Hall and return to his home in Windhelm, where he began performing a dark ritual, and rumours true enough circled Windhelm of what exactly he was doing. An adventurer, some say the Dragonborn, decided to investigate the rumours, and upon entering the Aretino residence, they found the young boy performing the Black Sacrament. Believing this adventurer to be a member of the Dark Brotherhood, Aventus tasked them to kill Grelod the Kind, whom he unsurprisingly developed a deep hatred for. Before long, Grelod was assassinated. Some guards claim to have seen the Dragonborn leaving the orphanage around this time, but who knows? The identities of assassins are not exactly boasted across taverns in Tamriel. Shortly afterwards, the adventurer was kidnapped and taken to an abandoned cabin in the marshes of Hjalmarch. There the Dark Brotherhood was waiting, and soon the Order of Assassins had a new member. Business resumed as normal for the guild as a number of people were found dead by professional hands across Skyrim. After a minor setback outside Lurius Farm in Whiterun, Cicero and the cart on which laid the Night Mother's concealed coffin finally reached the Falkreath Sanctuary. Reluctantly, Astrid welcomed the deranged jester and the Night Mother herself, but began growing paranoid over his ever-decreasing mental stability. Astrid tasked the newcomer with something more personal, and expressed her concerns with Cicero and his whisperings after locking himself in his room with the Night Mother's coffin. The recruit remained hidden within the coffin itself so as to eavesdrop on the jester, but as Cicero began speaking to his companion, the Night Mother spoke. The long silence had been broken. She spoke to the newcomer of how she pitied poor Cicero, who was not the listener, thus would never hear her voice. She declared the eavesdropper the new listener, gave them the covert phrase to relay to the Keeper, and informed them of a new contract that was awaiting at the old Nordic tomb of Volenrud. The coffin opened, and a shocked Cicero demanded an explanation. The newcomer relayed the covert phrase, and the jester jigged with overwhelming excitement and happiness. He had finally found the listener. Astrid wasn't particularly happy at this revelation, and asserted that she was still in charge of the sanctuary. After a short while, she decided that it would be madness to ignore the Night Mother's request, and the new listener travelled to Volenrud. There in the tomb was the client and his bodyguard Rexus, and the client was Armand Mortier, the probable descendant of Mirabel and Francois, and by then, 200 years into the Fourth Era, the Mortier clan was an ancient and powerful Breton family. Amond had reached out to the Brotherhood in order to eliminate the Emperor himself, Titus Mede II. It's likely that this contract would have allowed Mortier to advance beyond his station, as to cover expenses, he gave to the Brotherhood a very valuable one-of-a-kind amulet, given only to members of the Elder Council. Astrid knew that this assassination would propel the Brotherhood to heights they had not been for a long time, and it would also be quite a profitable one. In order for a chance at striking down Titus, they first had to bring him to Skyrim, and they would do so via his first cousin, Vittoria Vici. Vittoria oversaw the East Empire Company's holdings in solitude. At the time, she was engaged to Aesgear Snowshod of Riften, an investor and partner of Maven Blackbriar, and whose family connections with the Stormcloaks made the marriage appear as a step towards the restoration 
of friendly relations between the whole of Skyrim and the Empire. The Stormcloak Rebellion that had engulfed Skyrim at the time was reaching a turning point, and it had already caused enough damage to the province. Their wedding was of great interest to the Brotherhood, as it was the perfect opportunity to create a mess that would force the Emperor into coming north to deal with the aftermath. The plan was to publicly eliminate Vittoria Vici, which the assassins carried out with success. Vici's murder sent shockwaves throughout the Empire, and hope for reconciliation between them and the Stormcloaks was diminished. The Emperor was now on his way to Skyrim, thus the Brotherhood executed the next phase of their plan, the crippling of the Penitus Oculatus. However, back at the Sanctuary, not everything was going as smoothly. Cicero had fled the Falkreath Sanctuary and attempted to murder Astrid beforehand, but in doing so greatly wounded Vizara, the supposed last shadow scale, as his order was now extinct. The werewolf of the group and Astrid's husband, Ambion, chased Cicero all the way to the old Dawnstar Sanctuary. Outside, the wolf was injured, unable to continue. Cicero stumbled inside and curled up deep within the sanctuary, awaiting whatever fate befell him after the listener arrived. With the Cicero business dealt with, the Brotherhood continued on with their mission to kill the Emperor. The plan was for the newcomer to disguise theirself as the famous Gourmet, the highly talented cook that was hired to be the Emperor's private chef during his visit to Skyrim. The identity of the Gourmet was mostly unknown, but rarely has anyone ever escaped the Dark Brotherhood. It turned out that the Gourmet was an orc by the name of Balagog Granolob, and at the Nightgate Inn in the Pale, he took his last breath. With the Gourmet out of the way, all that was left to do was for the listener to infiltrate Solitude's Castle Dower and poison Titus Mead. Successfully passing off as the Gourmet, and with a little help cooking his signature dish, the Potage Le Magnifique, the assassin managed to poison the Emperor's dish, and as it was brought up and consumed, Titus became a lifeless body. Only it wasn't the Emperor who died. As the listener fled, they were ambushed by Commander Maro and several of his agents. He revealed that the man killed was merely a decoy, and that the real Titus Mead still lived. He also revealed that someone from within the Brotherhood had betrayed them, revealing the plans to kill the Emperor and the want to carry it out. In exchange, Maro was to allow the Falkreath group to continue their operation, but because the Brotherhood was responsible for his son's death, he intended to wipe them out regardless. A force of the Penitus Oculatus attacked the Falkreath Sanctuary, and by the time the new listener arrived, it was too late. The Sanctuary's old mage, Festus Crex, was annihilated by a flock of arrows. Fire engulfed the cavern. Another mage, Gabriella, was brought down, and not even Arnbjorn in werewolf form could stop the onslaught of the Oculatus. The Imperials raised the structure to the ground, and the listener became trapped. It was only by securing their self in the Night Mother's coffin that they were able to survive. Two other survivors, a red guard named Nazir, and an old child vampire, Babette, found and dug out the listener and the Night Mother from the rubble. Soon after, they discovered a horrendously burned Astrid lying on the floor of her hidden chamber, still alive. Surrounding her were candles and the fabled Blade of Woe. She had performed the Black Sacrament on herself. She revealed that it was her who double-crossed the new assassin, skeptical of Cicero and the Night Mother, while also envious of the title of Listener going to another. The Listener ended her suffering, and was now finally at the head of what was left of the once-notorious assassin. 
The three survivors abandoned the destroyed sanctuary and headed for Dawnstar. The decimation of the Falkreath Sanctum was the last straw, and there was no better time for revenge against the Empire, fortunate that it was also a contract. With the end of the Falkreath Refuge came a new beginning for the Brotherhood, but it may also have marked a final end for the Shadow Scales of Black Marsh, as Vizara also fell in the chaos. It appeared that even though punishment for betrayal came from an outside party, one way or another, the wrath of Sithis had come. With the help of Armand Mortier, the assassins located the real Emperor. Titus was aboard the Cateria, a majestic personal vessel of his anchored just outside Solitude. Successfully infiltrating the ship, the listener proceeded to the Emperor's quarters where Titus Mead was waiting. The Emperor revealed that he had accepted his fate, and that he believed it to be his destiny to die by the Brotherhood's hands. And so, without a struggle, Emperor Titus Mead II was assassinated. The exact fate of Commander Marrow, however, is still unknown. Armand Motier concluded business with the assassins by leaving a substantial amount of gold for them that would allow the guild to begin rebuilding itself. Though the fate of Motier is also disputed, as some say, he never left the bannered mare in Whiterun alive. Whatever transpired between him and the listener will probably remain between him and the listener. With the help of the Thieves Guild, the Dawnstar Sanctuary was restored, new recruits were taken on, contracts began to flow, and the Dark Brotherhood was once more feared and respected the world over. So started a future where many contracts began bound in blood. Whether or not this latest chapter in the Brotherhood's history is to be believed, it can be said that for as long as the Night Mother stays connected to the mortal world, the Dark Brotherhood will endure. Cicero and the Night Mother's fate may be unconfirmed, but perhaps that is the Brotherhood way. For their history to remain conflicted, otherwise this secret organisation wouldn't be so secret, would it? Some say that the new listener in Skyrim was aided by the spirit of none other than Lucian Lachance, and that the mysterious undead horse Shadowmere continued to serve. Even in death, the Guild of Assassins served the dread Lord Sithis, and the interests of the Guild in the mortal plane. The Void ever hungers for swords, and Sithis, or Padme, the darkness will always be there, and will always have what it wants, one way or another. With this knowledge comes the confidence for many to believe that someday the Dark Brotherhood will rise in power once more and become what it once was, perhaps even greater, for everything rises and falls. But that does not mean they cannot rise again.